Well, good afternoon. I'm Professor John Pazakli, Dean of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences here at the University of Melbourne. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this month's Dean's Research Seminar. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on today, the Wurundjeri and the Boon Wurrung peoples, as well as the traditional owners of the land you're situated on, and acknowledge that Indigenous Australians have been custodians of the lands and waterways of Australia for thousands of years. I also pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the role of Indigenous knowledge in our academy. Today, Professor Lee Garrett from Melbourne Veterinary School will give the Dean's Research Seminar entitled A National Approach to Research, Development and Extension for Wildlife Health and What Can Be Achieved with Collaborative Research, a Case Study of Cotridiomycosis. Professor Lee Skerritt completed his bachelor's degrees in animal science and veterinary science here and his PhD at the University of Melbourne. He became a member of the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists by examination in the specialist area of epidemiology in 2007. Lee then worked as a veterinary surgeon in the Latrobe Valley in research at the University of Wisconsin in the United States and held various academic roles at James Cook University, including senior lecturer, senior research associate, and associate dean for research before rejoining us back here at the Melbourne Veterinary School in 2019 as professorial research fellow in wildlife biosecurity and ARC future fellow and group leader. Lee has an H index of 48 and has published more than 400 articles, one book, eight book chapters and 14 government reports. He's also supervised 36 PhD masters or honors students and won a number of awards for his work. It's perhaps Lee's work on Cotridiomycosis, though, a fungal infection of amphibians that provides a well-documented example of infectious disease as a major evolutionary force that he is perhaps best well known for. Please welcome Professor Lee Skerritt. Lee, over to you. Oh, thanks very much for that introduction, John. I'll just share my slides so I can, in my talk. So thanks for, for coming, everyone. Um, um, sorry. Lee, sorry, I'm not seeing your slides at the moment. Maybe it's my computer. They're there, it's okay. Uh, yeah. It's good? Okay. Oh, that's thanks. Good, John. <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, so thanks to everyone for, for coming. I, I apologize a little bit for the title. I, I know it's quite a complicated one. Uh, and it's because um, I, I work uh, in this, uh, nexus between providing uh, national and international leadership in my area, but also trying to achieve some outcomes in, in research myself in, in the laboratory. Uh, and, and what I'm trying to do here is um, demonstrate how my experience in studying cotridiomycosis over the past uh, 25 years has helped me um, formulate um, ideas around uh, leadership and, and national coordination uh, for wildlife health research, development and extension. So just quickly, uh, a definition of wildlife health. So we, we uh, you know what I'm talking about. So um, currently wildlife health has a, is really seen uh, holistically as, you know, the physical, physiological, behavioral and social wellbeing of wildlife. At, at, a number of levels, individual population and the wider ecosystem level. And very importantly, also the ability of that um, wildlife to respond to change, you know, so their resilience to change, for example, like climate change or habitat fragmentation or even um, introduced disease. And by wildlife, we, we do refer to native and feral animals. Um, of course, with native animals, we're mostly concerned uh, around conserving them and preventing spillover of disease. Uh, whereas feral animals, it's, it's mostly that spillover of disease that we're concerned about into domestic animals and people, and, and even sometimes using disease as a biological control agent, which we, we do for rabbits with myxomatosis and rabbit calisti virus. So when I was a student, uh, back in the late 1980s uh, and, and early 1990s, 30 years ago, um, health in wildlife really wasn't regarded as important. Um, it was really seen as only compensatory um, for other processes um, governing uh, population dynamics in wildlife. 
And so wildlife health was really absent from veterinary and zoological textbooks. And, and mostly those, those textbooks focused on top-down effects like predation and bottom-up effects like resource limitation, habitat loss. But through um, um, theoretical modelling by Roy Anderson and uh, Bob May, um, they show that disease could in fact have um, uh, be uh, regulating populations, but also empirical evidence through um, Hawaiian um, bird declines through avian malaria and pox, uh, virus white nose syndrome in bats in North America, uh, West Nile virus also introduced to North America causing um, bird mortalities. We now know that disease uh, can have additive mortality and, and increased mortality and results in population declines. And we also know through our, our work as veterinary scientists that um, disease can also affect uh, recruitment through things like infertility. So as well as the importance of disease, of wildlife health affecting uh, conservation and biodiversity, uh, we also know it's important for ecosystem health that through um, population declines in key uh, species within ecosystems, it can have broader ecosystem uh, health effects. And we also know that um, disease can spill over into domestic animals and humans and have, have a major effect. And, this schematic represents our environment that we, we live in, the natural environment with wildlife operating, uh, living in it, uh, interacting with our human landscape, our, our domestic wildlife, our livestock and us. And, and the changes to this system through things like human behaviour and encroachment can lead to uh, emerging diseases like Ebola virus. And just some examples here to demonstrate the broader ecosystem effects that can occur through, through some of these uh, underlying drivers. Um, diclofen Act is anti-inflammatory used in cattle and particularly used in uh, places like uh, India and Pakistan. And um, uh, those animals that don't recover and go on to die, those carcasses are um, devoured by um, vultures and um, they are extremely sensitive to this drug and uh, it's led to their widespread decline and that's led to increases in other scavengers such as dogs and then an increase in rabies which is then uh, spilt over into humans demonstrating the the broad ecosystem level impacts of of a, of a wildlife health event Another potential example is um, the spread of chytridia mycosis through Central America, uh, leading to widespread frog declines, firstly in Costa Rica and then Panama, and then associated with that, the increase in malaria uh, uh, in people. And that's thought possibly due to the increase in mosquito populations through reduced predation by amphibians. So emerging wildlife health issues are are also a problem in Australia. Um, we have significant human health, economic, environmental and social impacts from uh, these emerging wildlife health issues. And some examples include COVID-19, although it emerged overseas, it quickly entered into Australia through people. Uh, we also have antimicrobial resistance spreading through wildlife populations. I mentioned Cotridia mycosis, which I'll talk about in more detail. But we've also had uh, catastrophic climatic events, um, including heat stress and bushfire mortalities in the 2019-2020 bushfires that led to widespread uh, mortality and morbidity. Uh, it's thought that over 3 billion animals were killed in those bushfires. So <clears throat> Australia is particularly vulnerable to these wildlife health events uh, with our unique biodiversity and our strong agricultural and tourism sectors. But the big question is what can we do about it? Uh, wildlife don't go to the doctor or, or the vet like our domestic animals. And, and that is the big challenge. And so what we've learned um, uh, over, and what I've particularly learned over the, the past 20, 20 to five to 30 years working in wildlife health, that because of our, you know, our resource limited field, um, the complexity of the problems that we face, um, you need a coordinated approach. And that involves prioritization so that you can um, divert resources to those issues that are, are most important and, and obtain timely and sustained resourcing to come up with solutions. You also need improved communication collaboration because you can't, um, 
you really can't afford duplication and you need uh, as much synergy as possible. And also uh, these uh, events um, are often abrupt, uh, their impact is uh, sudden. And so you need solutions quickly and they need to be tailored so that they can be readily used. And that requires necessary expertise being available. And what we found is if um, you're not progressing uh, quickly enough, it's often because expertise is lacking. And then because this is a relatively novel field and there's so many unknowns, um, we need to quickly share the knowledge that we gain through our research. and We need to quickly improve the standards um, to enable us to address, address the event. And a good example of that was the response to bushfires in 2019-20, which uh, resulted in uh, a, a massive increase in effort to better respond to these emergency events and develop um, uh, rehabilitation standards for the wildlife care sector. And lastly, wildlife health doesn't operate in a, a silo, it's, it's part of a continuum of issues that affect biodiversity, such as climate, climate change, habitat fragmentation, pollution. And so we, we need to integrate with these uh, other parts of the uh, environmental sector, uh, as well as, um, you know, because disease spills over from wildlife into uh, domestic animals and people, we need to interact with those sectors, uh, often in what's called a, a One Health framework. And, and, sim and similarly, our, the issues that we face in Australia are shared across the globe, uh, things like globalisation uh, occur in, in all countries. And so uh, we need international connections. So again, that we avoid duplication and uh, achieve uh, synergy in our efforts. So now I'm going to focus on this, this example that we've been working on, as I said, for the past 25 years and, and show you the, the research that we've undertaken and, and the approaches that we've followed to enable us to, to make advances and save species from extinction. So in the 1970s and 1980s, frogs were declining, particularly in the Americas and Australia, and, and no one really knew why. There were theories that it could be due to climate change, pollution, uh, loss of the uh, ozone layer. Uh, but it wasn't really until an outbreak investigation was undertaken that we really uh, got to the bottom of this mystery. And frogs were declining in these sorts of habitats, in the, you know, particularly in the tropics. So these rainforest streams, um, uh, aquatic associated uh, frogs um, with close relationships with water bodies. Uh, so on this particular stream in Big Tableland in the wet tropics in North Queensland, there were four species that occurred uh, along this stream um, uh, all the time, one, one during the day, the, the sharp snouted day frog. And um, this, this stream also experienced sudden, sudden decline and um, loss of those species from, from that stream. And as I said, we, it wasn't until we undertook an outbreak investigation and un, you know, studied the pattern of these declines that we were able to predict where the next declines were going to occur and intensively monitor those amphibian populations. And that's why we were able to detect uh, these sort of mass mortality events where large numbers of amphibians were uh, dying all at once. And you need to be uh, on site to observe these because um, dead bodies are quickly scavenged uh, and lost. Uh, in fact, you only detect a fraction of, of uh, carcasses that die in the wild due to um, degradation and scavenging. So the impact uh, of the spread of chytridiomycosis has, has been truly spectacular. It's caused dramatic declines in Australia uh, and the Americas in high altitude protected uh, mountain areas since the 1970s. Over 500 diverse species have declined and it's thought about 100 species are extinct. And it's regarded as the worst disease to affect vertebrate biodiversity on record. And it's caused by uh, this fungus, Petrarca cutrium dendrobatidis, um, and it's spread out of Asia due to poor biosecurity and globalisation. In Australia, it's uh, caused the decline of approximately 15% of our amphibian species, um, so 43 of about 240. Um, uh, seven of those are now extinct and nine uh, at least have management to prevent their extinction. At least there's 10 more that are vulnerable to extinction and need ongoing support. Uh, as well as sudden uh, 
declined. Uh, we've also had in the tropics where, you know, you get these mass mortality events and um, species disappear in a matter of months. We've also had uh, some slow declines and the southern crawberry frog is an example of that. Um, it's declined uh, gradually over 25 years and it's now functionally extinct in the wild. Uh, and these species have been in more temperate areas uh, where you get more variable temperatures and they're generally colder. And this species requires reintroduction to exist in the wild. So what's been governing our, uh, directing our response to, to this disease has been Australian government legislation um, and policy that um, uh, under the environmental Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act of 1999. And, and under that act, it, it says that anything that threatens more than one species can be listed as a key threatening process requiring a threat abatement plan to be developed to um, address that threat. And so um, chytrid fungus uh, was uh, listed um, as a key threatening process. And I'll just quickly go through how that came about. So it was chytridia mycosis was identified as a cause of amphibian declines in 1997, and a key paper was published by Lee Berger um, in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, um, outlining the, the, this disease causing decline in, in Australia and in Central America. Uh, and then a, a conference was organised by Rick Spear, who was a leader of the outbreak investigation and uh, supervisor of Lee's PhD, uh, getting the jump on amphibian diseases. And it recommended, uh, the stakeholders there recommended nominating this uh, novel infectious organism, BD, um, as, the, as a key threatening process in 2000. And then that went to the Minister for Consideration, uh, the Federal Minister for Environment, and was accepted uh, requiring a threat abatement plan to be developed in 2002. The Department of Environment and Heritage uh, invited a consultant that ended up being Rick and, and Lee to, to write the tap and uh, they sought the input of the key stakeholders, wildlife managers and researchers. Um, there were various uh, iterations of that document. It was released for public comment, revised and finally published. But whilst that was all going on, um, the uh, response to chytridia mycosis um, was undertaken and um, enabled um, species to be saved from extinction. Uh, since then, the, the threat abatement plan has been reviewed in 2012 and revised again in 2016, and it's currently under review again uh, by, by us and, and our um, collaborators. An important lesson from that is, um, all this required key people um, from end users, wildlife managers, and also research and development extension providers, people like Rick and Lee, to drive the response and provide oversight to the federal government. And uh, the threat abatement plan was split into two booklets, um, one on policy and, and another covering the, the background the science that justified the policy and then um, the revised threat abatement plan is there on the right. So the objectives of the threat abatement plan were to prevent the spread of the, the disease into areas, uh, to promote the recovery of, of those amphibians that were already impacted by the disease, um, to improve the management through research and monitoring, to inform all the stakeholders of, of uh, the most up-to-date knowledge, and to effectively coordinate management activities. And so this is where, you know, a big part of our responsibility was answering the research questions of the wildlife managers. And, and these were some of the questions that they posed to us. How can we test wild frogs and map Australia for this fungus? Where does it occur and which areas are still at risk? So uh, a risk analysis um, um, uh, process. Which disinfectants and medicines kill the fungus if we want to treat amphibians or um, disinfect uh, field equipment? Um, how, how does the disease, skin disease kill the frogs and is there anything else that we can do to help frogs survive infection? Uh, do we need to worry about reservoir hosts? Um, are they contributing to infection in susceptible species? Does vaccination work and is immunity involving? And, and what are the current impacts and are some frog species recovering? So 
So to, to answer these questions, we undertook a translational research approach. Um, we work directly with end users. We organise workshops for prioritising those research questions. And we tried to reduce the gap between research and management because uh, we could learn from each other. Um, we could also enable knowledge to be quickly transferred uh, by closing that gap. And that meant that we, we produced studies that, um, uh, that you know, answered those, those questions that I posed earlier. For example, what were the priorities for management and research? What's, the, what's a disease strategy uh, that can be undertaken if disease enters into a naive population? How can you minimise exposure of amphibians during field studies through improved biosecurity? Uh, what, how can you learn from reintroduction programs to better understand the disease and improve those reintroduction programs? Uh, and, you know, we also learned from this approach that you really do need to know your limitations. I'm showing my age here by uh, referencing uh, Dirty Harry and, and Magnum Force. It's an old movie. Um, but um, there's a great line in that from Harry Callahan, which is uh, a man's got to know man's got to know his limitations. And and that's really true for these complex problems. Um, each person has um, each expert uh, discipline has unique knowledge to contribute to help better solve these these issues. Uh, and so we quickly form multidisciplinary uh, research teams. And the other important thing is to have emotional intelligence and understand the needs of each, each other in those teams so that um, everyone's um, needs are met to, to the best um, uh, possibility. Uh, and so that everyone's um, uh, happy to keep collaborating So just a bit uh, about the, the fungus and what we learned. So this, um, this fungus, Petrarca kitchum dendrobatidus, or BD for short, is part of the phylum Contridia mycota. It's, as I said, a new genus and species described in 1999 by Joyce Longcore, who was a semi-retired retired recluse uh, chytrid taxonomist that um, we, we had to engage to describe this fungus. Um, and she named it after um, Petrarca uh, frog, meaning frog, and Kitra, Kitra uh, earthen pot um, from the Greek. Now, many of these uh, Kitra uh, fungi are environmental biodegraders, and a few are pathogens of uh, invertebrates and plants like mosquitoes and potatoes. But um, this is the first time that um, one of uh, these species has caused disease in a vertebrate host. Uh, this is work uh, was done by Lee Berger showing that the fungus is well adapted to frog skin. So the, the aquatic zoospore, the transmission stage, attaches to the outer layers of the amphibian skin and then injects germplasm down into the deeper layers of the epidermis through a, a, a germ tube uh, into the inside the keratinocytes. Um, and then as those keratinocytes develop, become keratinized and move towards the outer layers of the epidermis, the, the fungus um, develops as well into zoosporangium and into those zoospores. And you can see those in this um, um, histopathological section. You can see these early stages of the zoosporangium developing into individual zoospores. And then these are empty uh, zoosporangium towards the surface here that have discharged those zoospores into the external environment. And here's a scanning electron micrograph showing those discharge tubes with a percular um, that uh, are yet to um, dissolve and allow those uh, those spores to be released into the environment and, and allow transmission to occur. So in order to um, understand the distribution and determinants of this disease in Australia, we undertook opportunistic archived and systematic sampling uh, amongst many uh, of our colleagues and collaborators from 1956 to 2007 uh, and had over 10,000 individual amphibians sampled. And you can see in black here, the localities where we found the disease and um, the open circles are where the disease was absent. And you can see it's mostly confined to uh, cool, wet areas of the continent. And that's because this is an aquatic fungus that is uh, sensitive to temperatures. Uh, and that enabled us to do uh, modelling, uh, niche modelling, to predict uh, the uh, distribution of the disease. And you can see that 
Um, it could occur in, in some places where it's currently absent, such as southwest Tasmania and north Queensland on Cape York. And so we, we undertook uh, finer scale predictive modelling. This is work that was done by um, PhD students of ours, Chris Murray and Robert Puschendorf. Uh, and they showed that, uh, yes, indeed, this disease could spread to Cape York, but also that um, these red areas indicated uh, the most preferred areas within the wet tropics for the fungus and those amphibian populations that are particularly threatened and, and susceptible to decline because of the, the cooler, moister environments of those high altitude areas. We also found that um, this fungus has a broad host range. It, uh, it infects at least 63 species in Australia and the susceptibility varies. Uh, we did find that resistant frogs are reservoirs and they could explain why the virulence of this pathogen has been maintained, not just in Australia, but globally. And, and here are some potential uh, reservoir species, uh, Crinia signifera and also the cane toad. And we found that only the most vulnerable species have become extinct. Um, they're the ones that have uh, innate susceptibility to, to the fungus. They occur in optimal habitats, um, cool, moist um, environments for the pathogen. And often these species have slow reproductive strategies, uh, small distributions, uh, so they are unlikely to occur, unlikely to be able to respond to the increased mortality through reproduction, and they also are likely to just occur in areas favourable for the disease. We also um, discovered that we could reduce spread through improved biosecurity, and that's because the the pathogen is easy to kill through heat uh, and drying, and all this it's susceptible to all common disinfectants that are available, such as F10, ethanol, um, bleach. And we could also treat frogs through heat um, uh, for those that are able to withstand uh, temperatures of 26 to 30 degrees that will cure them of the disease. And also uh, antifungals like itraconazole will, will also cure them. So we're able to uh, eliminate infection um, from um, uh, materials that are likely to transfer it uh, across water bodies such as field gear and also eliminate it from amphibians that, for example, we wanted to bring into captivity and establish as captive assurance colonies. Uh, we also, um, as well as you know, improving the biosecurity of field work, we can improve the, the biosecurity of activities that uh, associate could be associated with spread of this pathogen through uh, for example, the, the use of water in the environment and transporting water across uh, uh, between water catchments, such as uh, firefighting and road building. Uh, the importance of this biosecurity work uh, is really demonstrated through the discovery of this sister species recently, Wataka Kitrium salamandra vorans, which target salamanders rather than uh, frogs. It spread to the Netherlands in 2010 and was discovered because of this uh, earlier uh, work on BD uh, and found to cause salamander declines there. Uh, like BD, it's also endemic to Asia and has spread through globalization and lack of biosecurity. But um, because of this you know, earlier work on BD, we we're able to undertake um, a risk analysis and identify the risk of this novel pathogen to the high salamander biodiversity that you find in North America, particularly in the US. Uh, we quickly found that this pathogen uh, prefers lower temperatures, has a, a deeper infection compared with BD shown here in the this histopathological infection. Um, um, uh, but because of this much quicker investigation response, it has led to a ban on salamander trade to the US and currently that continent is free of the disease and um, we've uh, potentially prevented the decline of many species um, from um, better biosecurity. But the holy grail of, of wildlife health um, uh, management and research is reducing the impact of disease once it's entered a wildlife population. Uh, and there are a number of ideas that have been explored for reducing the impact of uh, cutridia mycosis one is, is habitat modification because of the susceptibility of, of the fungus, the pathogen to heat 
um, so or or some of these chemicals, even salt. So um, and some amphibian populations have been able to uh, survive in more um, brackish environments close to the sea. Um, the, the other thing people have looked at is using micropredators that ingest the, the, the aquatic uh, transmission stage, the zoospores such as Daphne and zooplankton. Um, people have also looked at treating wild frogs with, with antifungals, um, and that has been successful, but only uh, works in the short term. As soon as uh, we withdraw treatment and those, uh, generally those susceptible species uh, die from the disease. Uh, people have also looked at bioaugmentation, so um, trying to modify uh, the uh, microflora on amphibian skin and make them more resistant to the pathogen. Again, this can work in the short term, but uh, in the longer term, it's hard to sustain these um, uh, um, augmented um, microbi microbial populations on amphibian skin. They quickly return back to their their natural populations. But two, um, two uh, approaches that really have worked is translocation of uh, populations to climatic refuges where the disease um, doesn't do as well because of uh, environmental conditions. And the other has been establishing captive colonies and BD free exclosures in the wild. And I'll talk about those um, briefly in the next few slides, as well as uh, some of um, the research that we've been doing to support recruitment uh, of um, wild populations through reintroduction and improving those reintroduction programs through things like potentially vaccination or improving innate host immunity. So as I said, climatic refuges from the disease have, have worked um, very well. Um, what, one of those has been the the armoured mist frog, um, which was thought to be extinct in rainforest in North Queensland. When we, uh, one of our PhD students, Rob Kuschendorf, rediscovered a population thriving in the adjacent hot, dry sclerophyll forest on the edge of the rainforest where we didn't think the species existed. And, and he found that um, because of that hot, hotter, drier environment and the sun heating up rocks, um, those the species was able to control infection um, by sitting on those hot rocks and so we translate we're able to translocate and establish populations of this species in similar habitats around the wet wet tropics and so improve the conservation of the almond mist frog uh, there are 12 species currently that have captive collections for their conservation reintroduction and research you know that um, currently uh, don't really have this opportunity for translocation. Um, we can only reintroduce them into their known former habitats where they're susceptible. And, and some of these species are functionally extinct in the wild and only really occur in the wild because of these reintroduction programs, such as um, Latoria castanea, um, the bulbul frog, P. frosti, and also the southern crawberry frog that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, Sudofrity, Grobery. Uh, and this is um, one of the BD free exclosures that's been established in um, Kosciuszko National Park to um, better secure this uh, southern Crawberry frog um, by increasing um, the, the population, but also trying to prevent adaptation to captivity um, because, because this species is functionally extinct in the wild. So through through these exclosures, we hope to um, uh, continue the um, selection of, of the natural environment on this, this species until we can find a long-term solution for re-establishing this species in the wild without these exclosures that, that exclude reservoir species and prevent the disease getting into this um, semi-wild population. So as I said, um, you know, we're trying to improve the, the reintroduction, uh, the survival of these species when they're reintroduced into the wild. Uh, and, and that's because um, if we don't do this, then um, it's likely these uh, reintroduction programs will fail in the long term because they'll be needed in perpetuity. 
Uh, and so one idea is to use immunity to improve the resistance of these individuals prior to their reintroduction. And, and one way that we could do that is through selection or genetic engineering for innate resistance. Uh, by identifying resistance genes to aid selective breeding and or uh, undertaking synthetic biology. So this is some work uh, done by a PhD student, Anthony Wall, just showing that acquired immunity does occur in some species. So this is an experiment. Um, this is a survival curve here where we've um, uh, exposed these animals previously to the pathogen, treated them with heat uh, and um, eliminated infection and then compared that to a, a heat control where we've just um, ex, you know, provided heat to animals, no prior exposure to the pathogen. And you can see this differential survival where um, animals that have had a prior exposure to the pathogen and been cured uh, months um, prior have a, a much better survival. And this is in green and golden bell frogs. Uh, this is um, work done by a, uh, a, a PSC student of ours who's now a DECRA fellow, Laura Grogan, looking at uh, transcriptomics gene expression in alpine tree frogs and um, characterizing the early immune response and showing that a rapid early immune response is also associated with some resistance. And, and that led us, this work led us to think about, you know, can we quantify the genetic component of, of this resistance, um, this innate resistance? And so our current work is really under, uh, uh, is in quantitative genetics and, and trying to understand, you know, in the variation that you see between uh, susceptibility on the left here in a population and resistance on the right, how much of that is due to genetics and how much is due to the environment and the interaction between those two. And so um, again, work that is encouraging in, in supporting a genetic component to resistance is uh, the differential uh, survival of um, populations of corroboree frogs. So here are uh, four populations of corroboree frogs from different areas in in Kosciuszko National Park. And you can see this green population has a higher survival, uh, uh, significant improved survival in the survival curve. And also over here, this is the intensive infection uh, that we measure over time. Uh, the amount of, of, of fungus that's on the skin um, measured by PCR. And you can see again, a low intensive infection in this green population over time as they start recovering. From, from the infection. So as well as um, quantifying the genetic component, we're also interested in the architecture of that, of that genetics. Um, so is, um, are there a few genes conferring uh, resistance uh, that have major effect or are there many genes that have, have minor effect? And the reason we're interested in this is because it, um, it affects how we might use those uh, genetics to improve resistance. So if we have few genes, then we can potentially undertake synthetic biology or marker assisted selection uh, if we have few genes of major effect. Whereas if we have many genes of minor effect, then we're, we have to resort to something like genomic selection where we gradually try and improve resistance through a breeding program. And that's work that we're, we're undertaking right now. It's being led by Tiffany Koch, a research fellow in our group, and Pally Davidson, a PhD student in collaboration with with Lee Berger and Amy Aquilina, our, our research technician. Uh, and we have a training population that we've obtained from our partners, um, zoos in Australia. Uh, and that's over a thousand animals that we are challenging with the uh, fungus and conducting an infection experiment and collecting phenotypes. So um, uh, intensive infection that I mentioned before through PCR and also days survived and time till first clinical signs. And then relating that to the genotype of these frogs uh, through sequencing. And we can estimate the effects of each gene variant and make a prediction model uh, of the level of contribution of, of each of those gene variants. And that enables us to go back to the main breeding population, which is all in captivity, uh, spread throughout institutions in Australia. And we can calculate the estimated breeding values of those breeding individuals and then select them to maximise um, their breeding value and minimise in breeding to increase the resistance of these individuals that we're then reintroducing into the wild. 
and hopefully establish sufficient resistance that those individuals can then be self-sustaining and won't die from the disease. Um, but as I said, as well as genomic selection, we're also considering synthetic biology approaches. That's where we might introduce um, foreign genes, um, either from resistant individuals within the species into susceptible individuals, or potentially from other resistant species uh, through transgenesis or possibly just through gene editing if there's minor changes that need to occur uh, through shared genes across individuals or species. Uh, and this synthetic biology approach also opens up the opportunity of even developing complete novel genes. Um, um, and that we can do that through exploiting pathogen vulnerabilities. And one way to do that is through RNA interference. So this is a, a mechanism that organisms naturally have to defend themselves against viruses. Uh, and it's um, where the, the, the cell recognises double-stranded RNA and cuts it up and then um, to, to destroy it. And so you can manipulate this defensive mechanism by introducing small interfering RNA designed to a specific gene of the organism. So one of its own, for example, pathogen virulence genes, and then that pathogen will, will destroy its own mRNA and su suppress that virulence gene and potentially turn a pathogen from being virulent to avirulent. And we can potentially um, incorporate genes into the host that produce this um, um, small interfering RNA um, that there is a in the site where the pathogen occurs, when infection occurs, such as in the skin of amphibians, and then that, that uh, RNA can be absorbed by the pathogen and, and render it avirulent. And this um, approach is called host-induced gene silencing. But, you know, as you can, you know, you can see that there's, uh, there's a lot of technological challenges with these approaches um, and, and there's, um, you know, we're really trying to adapt them from model species into wild species and, and there are a number of hurdles to overcome. And, and we're just coming across some of them right now in, uh, for example, um, the Crawberry frog genome. Uh, if we look at uh, genome size across vertebrate taxa, you know, there's some particularly large ones there, but um, the crawberry frog genome is 8.6 uh, gigabases, so it's it's on the large size. So that means that it's quite a bit of work to to do to assemble and annotate that genome. So it's in a state that you can then start using it for uh, synthetic biology and genetic manipulation. Uh, of course, you know another issue that gets raised frequently when we um, talk about synthetic biology is the public support for for that. Uh, encouragingly. Um, Australian uh, support is is reasonable. Um, you know, uh, Australians recognise that this approach is risky, um, but um, they also are willing to accept it uh, if if it can be safe, it can, if it can be guaranteed to be safe, and also can be justified. The rationale that no, there are no alternatives uh, to this approach, and that's why we're doing things like genomic selection. Uh, if we can do that, we will. If we can't, then you know, this is a potential fallback approach. So, so just, you know, that's, that's really all I wanted to say about that case study that we've been working on for quite a while. And, and some of the take home uh, messages from that is that, you know, you really need the people responsible for these issues to select the, the priorities for research development extension. And in our case, it's been the amphibian managers but uh, the challenge is that often these people, they're very busy managing a crisis and they need help from expertise such as uh, researchers to, to facilitate the conversations that can identify those priorities and, and the potential solutions. And then uh, secondly, as I've been saying all along, you, you know, to develop uh, tailored solutions that are ready for use, um, you need expertise to collaborate, but there are challenges with that because a lot of um, most RDNA incentives are competitive where um, one idea is rewarded. Uh, and the problem with that is if that idea is um, not proving fruitful, how do you quickly transition to the alternative ideas that have been suggested? Uh, and the other issue is that, um, you know, even if there is some promise with, with one of those ideas, often the solution takes many years to, to uh, arrive at and that needs sustained um, resourcing whereas you know as we all know research is often um, funded in the short term and as I said you know um, you need um, uh, management and research to work together but 
they're often in separate organisations. And lastly, uh, you need leaders and, and followers to facilitate these things to occur, but um, to drive prioritisation collaboration, but often there's little incentive for that, uh, especially if those leaders and followers are really enabling others to, to find the solutions. There's often no credit uh, given or resources given to those people that enable that to happen. So, so just quickly back to you know the title of my talk, um, the national um, uh, approach, you know, and where we're at. So we have a, a ten-year plan and a model for collaboration, integration, and resourcing. Uh, it includes um, diverse participation and inclusion. It's uh, a decentralised collaborative model of hubs and nodes uh, shaped by local contexts. So priorities feeding up from the local level to the national level, and then solutions being delivered back down at the local level. Um, uh, it, it's integrated, the plan's integrated with our current wildlife health system, particularly surveillance, and Wildlife Health Australia is seen as having a key role. And we're now at the implementation stage and really trying to work out what is possible. What can we work on? Who will do what? And what resources can we commit to it? And uh, more information is available on the Australian Wildlife Health Institute Initiative website, and you can also contact the project coordinator, Min Yap. Her email's there. So just, just before I finish, I'd really like to thank uh, the One Health Research Group that is driving much of this work and, and um, the national approach. Um, the One Health Research Group uses One Health approaches, which is uh, using expertise across ecology, veterinary science, and, and human health to better deliver um, solutions that benefit all those sectors. It, it consists of about 30 people. It has uh, strengths in, in chytridiomycosis and other emerging wildlife health issues like Phalaris uh, toxicity pictured here in this uh, Eastern Grey Kangaroo. Um, we have a um, large amount of um, focus obviously on training in veterinary students and science students and also postgraduate, um, postgraduate research students and also overseas in development programs. Uh, we run a surveillance program uh, through Pam Whiteley and um, we also, as I've been saying, been heavily involved in leadership and collaboration. And just quickly, um, you know, these are some of the key staff um, that are involved. I uh, also want to acknowledge the, the tremendous support that we get from others within the vet school and the faculty. Um, Joe Devlin in uh, virology and colleagues, uh, Mark Stevenson and colleagues in epidemiology, Mark Miranda and colleagues in microbiology, um, Panos uh, and colleagues in pathology, that we really rely on these discipline experts to, to provide the expertise required to solve, um, better solve many of these wildlife health issues. And also the, the leadership at um, the Melbourne Vet School and the faculty is, is also very important in facilitating um, our, our uh, approach to, to these uh, wildlife health issues. Uh, lastly, I just want to acknowledge uh, our collaborators um, in Australian governments and Australian zoos and other university and research provider institutions uh, and, and uh, our funders. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lee. Um, can I invite people to put questions in the Q and A? And while you're thinking about that, um, Lee, that was a that was a great story, nicely told, and I really like your multidisciplinary approach and bringing people together across different skills. And I think that's so important in studies such as these. I thought your study of uh, chytridiomycosis, or the part of the story that you gave us today, um, was fascinating and nicely told. Um, while well, people are putting questions in the Q&A, maybe I'll just start with a, a question. I have been was thinking about the genetics while you were talking, and I think you said the chytrid fungus came from Asia. And then it set me thinking, well, Asia is a big place. I wonder if they know where in Asia it came from, because you'd think that there may be frogs in that part of the world that actually were resistant to this fungus. And maybe that would tell us something about their defense mechanisms or their different genetics that made them uh, resistant. Um, could you say something about that? Maybe some of the work you talked about on the genetics involved those frogs. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's a great idea, John, and that's certainly something that we 
you know, we're keen to look at, and people have started looking at that and, and showing that, yes, yeah, Asian frogs are more resistant to these pathogens, both BD and uh, Bichocos chitrin salamander warans, the salamander chitrin fungus. And um, what, we, what we really need is, you know, comparative studies among species, and that's, that is a little bit difficult because, you know, you need um, collaboration across countries um, you need species um, from each of those countries to, to go to probably the one institution to do the large infection experiment to do the comparison and identify the genes. Um, but yeah, I, it's a great idea. And it, it certainly, I think if we were to go down that synthetic biology approach of, you know, thinking about transferring genes from resistant species to, to not uh, susceptible species, that, that would be really useful work to do. Okay, thanks, Lee. I might come back with some other questions in a minute, but let me go first to Anna Shri. Um, Anna, do you want to ask your question? Uh, you may need to unmute. Thank you. I just wanted to ask um, how you see this work fitting into an Australian CDC, um, if that develops, um, and if it follows a One Health approach, how that would work. Thanks, Lee. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Anna. There are a number of proposals going around at the moment. Um, we have a Australian CDC, which is uh, thinking about talking about all um, disease, uh, including non-infectious. Um, one of the issues I think is is if they did go ahead, um, we'd we'd quickly get swamped because uh, infectious disease is a very minor component of human health, and then um, the sort of things that I'm talking about, um, you know, particularly the zoonotic aspects of of wildlife health. Uh, again, a minor component of that. Um, there has been also a proposal for just a, a, a institutes of infection uh, proposal, um, and Melbourne University has been involved in that. And I think we'd have a better chance if if there was a truly one health approach to controlling infection, uh, because we do know that you know a lot of these novel infections in humans are derived from animals, um, domestic animals, and and wildlife. Uh, so I, uh, um, I think there's a real potential for um, this out for our expertise to provide intelligence on uh, wildlife health to, for example, interested human health stakeholders. So we could provide them with, you know, what's going on in wildlife populations that could better inform their risk analysis for where the next, you know, emerging human disease might come from, and and how better to mitigate. The underlying drivers of those spillovers you know like i talked about earlier things like human encroachment increasing um, agriculture impinging on uh, native habitats um, we could you know if we if we recognize through our surveillance in wildlife populations uh, pathogens that are at risk of of using that those changed circumstances to spill over then maybe that will drive policies to prevent that thanks Thanks very much for that question. Um, question from Vern Bowles. Vern, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, Lee, um, I'm interested in those, you know, the flooding events that we're having in southern Queensland and New South Wales over the last two or three years, which are pretty unbelievable. Um, I'm just interested to know, do you see those as posing major issues for the spread of something, say, like chytrid? And if so, um, are there active plans at the ready to be monitoring such events so you know you can get on top of things before they become serious? Yeah, that's a great question, Vern. And, and actually, we have had an increase in uh, what we think increased mortality of amphibians uh, in the last few years, um, particularly in urban environments. Um, and that's thought possibly to be related to La Nina, providing uh, wetter and cooler um, conditions that favour the fungus and also possibly because of people being more at home and, and interacting more with wildlife and, and detecting more sick and, and dead amphibians. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have had a, a, an outbreak response to that to try and better understand that outbreak and is it just chytrid or is there, um, is there something else going on and have we had another introduction of, of the pathogen or is it the same same pathogen that's that's just using these more favourable conditions to cause increased mortality? And I think um, that's also led to, to your second 
part of the question is, you know, we're, we're still in this very much response phase, you know, we're relying very much on passive surveillance um, and increased morbidity, mortality events, and then, and then outbreak investigation. And what we'd like to do is move to more uh, proactive surveillance, risk analysis, health assessment systems so that we can better predict these things and be prepared for them. You know, so, yeah. you know, in an ideal world, we would recognise these La Nina, for example, La Nina events as potentially causing increased morbidity and mortality and be ready for that. Um, and, and so have um, um, better systems in place if we, if we could mitigate the impact or if, if there are particular vulnerable populations, we could, we could help them through these um, events. Right. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Fern. Um, Lee, we're, we're almost out of time. Um, so I will go, I've got a couple of other questions, but I'll just choose one of them. And, and that is, why did you choose the corroboree frog to be the, uh, the mascot of this whole program? I mean, it's, it's cute yellow and black and all the rest of it, but was there any other reason? Yeah, it's a good, good question. Uh, lastly, we, we did, you know, choose it because of that, you know, because it's it's iconic and that we can use it to drive support. But but also it's because we had good, um, you know, captive assurance colonies and breeding programs in place. So, you know, we can only really do these large sort of uh, genomic uh, training experiments because of that, um, those captive assurance colonies and captive breeding program. We don't really have that in place for many of the other species. Um, so there are some potential other species that we could use as, as model species, but because they're not um, critically endangered, we don't have that level of uh, support from our collaborators like, like the zoos. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah but yeah. We, do, we do dabble, you know, we do, you know, use other species where we can to fill in some of the knowledge gaps. Um, like I mentioned, the green and gold bell frog that we worked on for understanding and acquired immunity. Um, the the transcriptomic work that I mentioned we did in alpine tree frogs. So we we do use other species where we can, but but for um for particularly this genomic selection and really understanding the genetic architecture of a species resistance, uh, we really uh, had to use the the crawberry frog. Yeah, it seems to me that the uh, the key the key areas now are looking at the genetics and what might what might uh, be uh, governing resistance and susceptibility and understand the, the immunity. And I'd love to have a discussion about the immunity of the skin of, a, of an amphibian and, and, and refresh my memory if I ever had any real knowledge of uh, as a virologist of what is the main immune response to fungi. Um, but I, I think that'd be a fascinating area. And you talked about multidisciplinary science and uh, I'm sure you've got lots of collaborators in those areas. Um, Okay. Yeah, that's right, John. Yeah, we work with amphibian immunologists. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a that's another seminar. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, look forward to that one. Um, <laughs> Lee, thanks very much. I'm just going to say a, a, a few words uh, about the next uh, the next Dean's Research Seminar. So, first of all, thanks to you, Lee, in particular, for today's Dean's Research Seminar. I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to join us. Um, as you may know, these are available online, so you can watch them at your leisure, and people that haven't had a chance to uh, join us um, at the actual event will no doubt watch them. Um, I hope you'll be able to join us next time, which the next Dean's Research seminar, seminar will be on the 8th of November, and we'll have a group presentation, so something a little bit different, uh, a group presentation from the um, parasitology team. So until the 8th of November, thank you very much, and Lee, thank you very much to you. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone.